Okay, I come to you today just doggone confused. I've been working through the Young Earth Creationist literature on the flood, post-flood boundary. Uh, there's different models within Young Earth Creationists for how to explain where the flood ended and what are the post-flood events. And in particular, I've been reading about the late Cenozoic flood boundary and trying to understand the position of the Institutes for Creation Research, which is the primary promoter of this particular view. And I've just become confused. I, 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 I kind of get it. Um, but on the other hand, there are aspects of that model that just don't jive in their literature. And so it seems like their literature contradicts itself, uh, you know, at the ICR website. So what I want to do is I present a couple examples of that. I'm hoping maybe you can help me um, figure out what's going on here. Is there, is there a contradiction or am I simply missing something? So let me explain using their words, all right, what the late Cenozoic flood boundary is. And then I want to talk about dogs and the canine kind, because it's when I start thinking about the canine kind and figuring out, well, how would they understand the origins of the canine kind and how the canine kind survives through the flood that I get horribly confused. Uh, and so let me share my confusion and then give me some feedback. Let's try to figure this out. So that's coming up. So before we begin, we have to do a, a, just a short primer on the two primary models uh, that Young Earth Creationists have proposed for how to identify where the end of the flood deposits are from Noah's worldwide flood versus post-flood deposits. And there are two primary views, although there's a lot of uh, variation within those. And then there are some other rarer, um, less popular views. But the two most popular views uh, here on the right would be the Cretaceous Paleogene, or sometimes called the KT or KPG boundary model. And in that particular model, um, they would place all of the material from the Cenozoic, which would be from conventionally dated 66 uh, million years ago, uh, all the way to present as being deposits that occurred after the flood. And so any fossils in that particular layer also were of organisms or animals that had departed from the ark and then were trapped in and fossilized after uh, Noah's flood. So in the last 4,350 years or so ago. Uh, and then opposing that particular view is the Neogene Quaternary Boundary, which um, other creationists have argued is the what's called the Late Cenozoic Boundary Layer. And so after the Neogene, which is all, which ends about uh, two point, I think it's two point six or so million years ago, and then any sediments after that are post-flood sediments. So these are these are very different views of how much uh, post-flood uh, catastrophes may have happened, as you're going to see in the quote I'll, I'll pull up in just a moment. Let's let the Young Earth Creationist literature uh, speak for itself for a moment. I, I think this um, introduction to a paper that discusses the post-flood flood boundary uh, it illustrates exactly what's at stake here. So uh, Roy Holt uh, in 1996 uh, wrote this paper, Evidence for a Late Cenozoic Flood Post-Flood Boundary. And in there, he says, the location of the flood, post-flood boundary in the geological record is important because of its tremendous impact on interpreting events during and after the flood. The boundary is the key to understand Earth's geological history as its determination sets limits on flood, post-flood erosion, sedimentation, volcanism, continental sprint and drift, the movement of continents around, tectonic activity, sea level changes, and etc. The location of the boundary simultaneously sets limits on pre-flood and post-flood biological diversity and biological change and climate variations in post-flood times. All right, so he's setting the stage for, depending on where you find this boundary of where the flood deposits end and the post-flood deposits begin, that's going to impact your views of all these other topics. Placement of the boundary in the early to middle portions of the geological column that's more the Answers in Genesis, um, uh, Andrew Snelling uh, view of the K, uh, 
say the KT or KPG boundary 66 million year goes million years ago in conventional dating um, implies tremendous post flood catastrophism, explosive biological changes and huge post flood climate variations. So if you take that view, you're going to have to propose there was an enormous amount of catastrophism that occurred after the flood because you have, in some cases, thousands of feet of sediment that still have to be deposited and you have billions of fossils in the post-flood uh, geological column that you're going to need to explain. And then you're also going to have a tremendous number of, of different diverse organisms that exist in those as fossils in those post-flood sediments that only exist there and aren't found below in the flood layer. So you have to propose there's an enormous amount of biological change that's occurred. And uh, there's also post-flood climate variation, which would then result in all these catastrophes. In contrast to that, a late placement of the boundary implies a more violent flood, little a violent flood because the flood itself has, has to account for almost all of the geological column. So, and you have to contain that within a year. And so you're gonna have to smoosh in a lot more activity during that time. So therefore you're gonna propose a more violent flood. Little post-flood catastrophism, all right? Relatively mild climate uh, after, the, after the flood and very little biological change. I mean, there's only a very thin slice of material on top of the flood layers, and it contains fossils that, of organisms that look very similar to today's organisms or species. And therefore, you don't have to propose a lot of biological change having occurred after the animals departed from the ark. A comprehensive creation model cannot be developed separate from a definitive placement of the flood post-flood boundary. And... I've been saying this, and many creationists have been saying this, but do you notice when this was said? In 1996. And it, that's 25 years ago. And what's the situation today? They still don't have. Creationists still do not have a comprehensive creation model, in part because they cannot decide on where the flood, post-flood boundary is, despite 25 years of continued discussion, research, and talk. Um, there is a vast, you know, uh, amount of disagreement within, within the young Earth, young Earth creationist community about how to identify the post-flood boundary. And as a result, it's, they come to different conclusions about biological change, about how much, uh, what the world was like right after the flood, about ice ages, about, you, you name it. One of the reasons there's variation among creationists in these views of all kinds of other issues is because they differ at sort of this root level of finding the post-flood boundary. Um, now, I've been working with the, uh, the ICR model or the late Cenozoic boundary. And it's not just the ICR model, but pretty much everyone at the at ICR holds to this late Cenozoic um, flood boundary. And then there's a bunch of independent uh, young earth creationists that also uh, buy into that uh, particular model as well. And so I think here we have um, Timothy Clary, who's at Answers, uh, sorry, Institute for Creation Research. Uh, and he's written on this topic many, many times. And he's said something like this almost every time in every article. Uh, so here he is pointing to what his favorite argument is for why the late Cenozoic boundary is the right one. The sheer volume and global extent of marine rocks deposited in the tertiary. Now the tertiary would be the, the period from the end of the Cretaceous uh, Paleogene boundary, 66 million mark. That, by the way, is the, is the point at which you have the, uh, the asteroid impact in the Yucatan Peninsula, which is said to have wiped out the dinosaurs, right? So if you need a time marker in your head. And, and the tertiary then goes all the way up through the Neogene right up to the, the, the present, uh, the, the Quaternary um, period. So it covers most of uh, the Cenozoic. Um, is what tips the scale in favor of an upper Cenozoic post-flood boundary. And, and then here is, here is how strongly he feels about this. We suggest that this data is so vast and complete that it is nearly inconceivable to argue otherwise. Now, of course, those that answers in Genesis and other, uh, other creation scientists do argue otherwise. And they have similar language about how the late Cenozoic model is utterly and completely wrong. But that's a story for another day or 
a story for another video that I've already made, you know, that you can go watch. That's not what I'm here for right now. I'm here right now to try to clear up some of my own, uh, to explore some of my confusion about this model. Because in reality, as I read their geological arguments for why a late Cenozoic boundary is necessary, and more specifically, why the K uh, PG boundary must be wrong, the earlier boundary, um, they've got me convinced that if there is a global flood, that that's where you'd have to find the boundary, that it, not, that it can't be found earlier. So they have me convinced in the sense of they've convinced me the other side is wrong, the other creationists are wrong. But they haven't necessarily convinced me that they've found, you know, a position that answers all questions because they leave me with a whole lot of questions. And I'm going to bring one of those questions to you right now. So uh, 2014, just, to, just one more quote before we get into it here. Um, Ord, in the Journal of Creation, writing about the post-flood boundary, and he's a supporter of a, of a late Cenozoic time period uh, boundary too. He makes this observation, which leads us into my problem. The finding of sometimes similar animals in both flood and post-flood deposits may seem perplexing at first glance. Um, yes, that is very perplexing. And not just at first glance, but as I'm going to show you, as I dig deeper into it, it remains perplexing. <laughs> An examination of the biblical orchard of life explains how this could happen. It does not explain how this could happen, but we'll let him say a few words about that. The flood is considered a great bottleneck, where two of each kind of air-breathing laying animal were taken on the ark. I've used that bottleneck language many times myself in describing the, res the product or results of a uh, restriction of organisms down to just two individuals. This would cause a loss of genetic diversity within each kind. Presumably, there would be a fairly large amount of genetic variability within the kinds in the ark, although less than that in the less than was present in the pre-flood world. After the flood, a male and female of each kind would multiply and spread across the earth. They would diversify after the flood, called speciation, but with less genetic material than before the flood. The mass extinction at the end of the Ice Age once again culled some of the variety within each kind. So he's proposing that there was a massive amount of inbuilt variation in the original created kinds God made in the beginning. And then they diversified into an enormous number of diverse species within each kind or varieties within each kind. Then there's this giant bottleneck effect of the, of the flood because only two individuals could survive. They obviously aren't going to carry all the genetic variation with them, and so there's a loss of genetic variation. After the flood, they then re-expand into the world and diversify to some extent, but they may be very limited in how much they can diversify. This is where we're getting, this is very different than, say, the Answers in Genesis model, which, which proposes Im immense amounts of diversity after the flood. So Ord's arguing for a limited amount of genetic diversity and speciation after the flood. Um, but then, of course, you then you have the Ice Age, and that then culled, as he puts it, like many species didn't survive through the Ice Age. And so we have even a smaller representation of the diversity of life with us today. Um, so that's his, you know, big vision for, uh, I guess you could say, the, the history of life. Um, therefore, we would expect to see far greater variety of mammals in flood sediments compared to post-flood sediments. That, uh, here's another spot where this is going to differ a lot from the Snelling's view and others. Uh, I'll say even the most popular view in Young Earth Creationists, I think, be, simply because Answers in Genesis and Ken Ham promotes this other view. It is the most popular. Um, and... But what Award is saying here is we would expect to find more mammal species in flood deposits compared to post-flood deposits because there aren't very many flood post-flood deposits. And there's less diversity after the flood in his, his mind and others at Institute for Creation Research. This appears to be the case before and after the mid-Pleistocene in southwest Kansas and Blanco Canyon. That's in the paper that I'm quoting from. He's studying that particular area and looking at the fossils before and after what he thinks is the late Cenozoic flood boundary. 
The tremendous biological diversity we see in the fossil record reflects pre-flood genetic variability within Genesis kinds was not sustained after the flood. There was no explosion of biological diversity after the flood. The genetic bottleneck at the flood apparently greatly reduced the variation variability within Genesis kinds and or numerous Genesis kinds became extinct soon after the flood. And I've talked a lot about the extinction problem in other videos. All right. We're ready to dive into the question now. So given that background and this late Cenozoic flood boundary, what are the implications of the late Cenozoic flood boundary and uh, for speciation, diversity, and how many animals were on the ark? Uh, so I have this question, you know, I, have, I immediately thought of this, like what is the origin of canines in the minds of those that are late Cenozoic flood boundary types? All right. There's 30 some species of canines that are alive today. There's another hundred or so species that are known from the fossil record as well. Most young earth creationists, they use language about dogs or canines as if they're all one kind, meaning they're a single family. Uh, and if they're a single family, then they would only have to be represented on the ark by a pair of animals um, that would then give rise to what we have today. You know, and, and within that family, of course, you've got dogs, which there's a tremendous variety of different breeds uh, within there, but they're just a small portion of the overall genetic variation. And they only represent um, something very similar, really the same species as a wolf. And so there's a huge amount of other variation or genetic variation and morphological variation uh, within the rest of the canines. And so where do you find a canine kind? And, and like, as I was saying, Ken Ham would find the origin of the kind right back here, right? And say like all the canines you see alive today, they are related by common ancestor to some ancestor that represents the original kind. And also for Ken Ham, he would say that that's the arc kind as well, because that, that, that all of these must have been represented by individuals on the arc that represent the kind. But are canines a single kind? Because as we're going to see, that creates a big problem. This, the, the, this, the, the fossil record of where you find canines in the fossil record creates a big problem for this late Cenozoic view. Depending on how you want to pitch what a kind is. Uh, and so I've tried looking through the Institute for Creation Research literature about how they respond to like, what is a dog kind? I've heard talks by ICR um, speakers and they all talk about dogs as if, um, they usually talk about dog and dog breeds um, and less so about canines overall, but every time they do mention canines, and so this is just a quick example here, Chromosomes show that the domesticated dog, Canis lupus familiaris, is a gray wolf. Additional DNA studies provide strong evidence that all dog breeds descended from a wolf population that is domesticated in Southeast Asia. All right, so they're saying, yes, they share a common ancestor. Um, they're not separately created. But then they go on to say dogs, wolves, coyotes, and foxes can interbreed. So they represent the created dog kind, right? They're, they're, they're using the... the um, the ability to um, hybridize as their their standard for um, or identifying characteristic of being a kind. And so here's one instance where they're suggesting that dogs, wolves, coyotes, and foxes, and foxes are the most different kind of canine there is genetically, morphologically. And so this is a, an affirmation that all the canine species alive today are a single kind been formed all right since the post in post flood history this to me this is where the contradiction this is why i am so doggone confused as my title says right because it's like okay i get it this is the way creationists talk they talk about all the dogs being the same kind but then you have to apply that idea right you have to apply that assumption to your model of the flood post flood boundary and now you have to explain how dogs how the canine family or kind has moved through history right from creation to the flood and post flood how they diversified how they've how they've covered the world how they've come to be where they are and i just don't get it when i look at the late cenozoic 
flood model. And here's why. So the late Cenozoic would be, all right, so what I'm showing you is uh, um, from the Paleo Bio database, all right? Really great fossil uh, website. And here you can plug in, uh, you know, a, a name of a group of organisms, and they'll show you where fossils are known to be of that particular group. And more importantly, it'll show you in what layers of rock they're found in, all right, or the, what layers of the geological column they're found in. So what I'm showing you is the Cenozoic right here, all right, spans this whole time period. That time period would be 66 million years. And this is where, remember, right down here is where Andrew Snelling, Answers in Genesis, and others, and I would say the most popular view of where the flood deposits end, and then the post-flood deposits continue through the Cenozoic up to the present time. And so any fossils found in Eocene rock or Oligocene rock or so forth, any fossils found there are fossils of animals that departed the ark and then succumbed to other natural phenomena that managed to fossilize them in the post-flood world. And so they're all occurred sometime in the last 4,500 years. What, is the, what does the late Cenozoic model say? All right, Timothy Clary, he says he finds the boundary to be right here, all right? So if you think of a, a time scale here, um, this is just two point, I think it was 2.6 million years. Uh, and I should have looked that up and remind myself, I always forget my dates. And the Q is for quaternary, the quaternary period, the period that, that we're in right now. And so only, you know, all this material, right? All this material is flood deposits and then only after that is post-flood deposits so now let's see how that affects how we think about canines all right so what i'm showing you right now is the paleocene just this period and i've asked in the paleocene where are the canididae all right which is the family of the canines all right the family canine are there any fossils known fossils, recognized fossils of any member of that family. And as you can see from this map, I'm not showing the entire world, but I can assure you I looked over the whole world. There are no known fossils from the family of dogs. And then what comes before the Cenozoic is the Mesozoic, which is the age of the dinosaurs. And then you go back and there's a huge amount of right geological column below this. There are no, there are absolutely no known dog fossils, canine fossils from anywhere in the fossil record up through into the Cenozoic and through the Paleocene. So next slide, let's go to, and I search for the Eocene. Ah, now when I go to the Eocene, we start seeing some dots show up. And if you were on the website, you could click on the dot and you could find out, hey, here's this fossil from this particular genus. And most of all of these are extinct species and genera of things that are in the dog family. They're similar enough morphologically from their uh, anatomy that we would say those represent things that we would put in the dog family. So that's where we first start seeing them in the fossil record. These are the first records. And we see a bunch here in North America, and then, but there's actually a couple here in Europe as well. So during the Eocene, you know, 30 some million years ago, uh, we start seeing canine fossils. So now let's go to the Oligocene. All right, we go to the Oligocene. So we're moving forward in time. We start seeing more spots in more areas. Um, some in Europe, still don't have any in Africa, and I don't think there were any in South America at this time. Now let's move up into the Miocene. And we start now we start seeing lots of different locations, right? A lot of fossils. And we also, what, what I'm not showing here is there's more and more species. So if you keep clicking on the dots and you look at, there's more species in more genera. So we started out with a just a couple genera, right? And they're all very similar to each other. And then we have more genera and more diversity of types of dogs. And then we have even more right species of canines and the canines now are you know, i'm not showing you but they're in south america they're in africa they're in europe and they're over in asia 
All right, so essentially canines are covering the whole world at this particular point uh, and different species in different places and different genera on different continents. So now let's go to the Pliocene. All right, the Pliocene, which would be the very last stages of the flood deposits according to Institutes for Creation Research. So we have Pliocene. We're still looking at just members of this family. They're identified in this family. And we have lots and lots of dots. We have some money of the same species that are found in the Miocene, but we now have some new species started showing up. And we have a couple new genera that are showing up. So new groups of canines. All right, so now these would all be things that, according to Institute for Creation Research, were all buried in flood deposits. So these are all or all animals, all canines that lived prior to the flood, were presumably all living prior to the flood, and they got caught up in the flood and they got deposited in this order. Now the order itself is interesting, right? Because it's oops, if we go back again, there's nothing here and nothing below it. And then we get a few deposited, then we get more deposited, then we get even more different species deposited. In other words, the diversity of canines increases. I don't know how the flood would sort that out or you know, show this pattern. Nonetheless, that is the pattern we see. Those are the observed facts of the fossil record. And then we get to the Pliocene, there's even greater diversity. Now, what would we expect when we step into all right, the Pleistocene? which is the next P there. <laughs> We're gonna step into the Pleistocene in a moment, which is in the post-flood time. So in the post-flood time, that is two, just two representatives of all these different species and all this different diversity, right? Just two of those were put on an arc and eventually they end up departing from that arc here. And now they have to spread across the world somehow, right? fill this world with diversity again. Um, wouldn't you expect that there should be very, very few fossils in the early Pleistocene? Or, or yeah, Pleistocene, and then maybe they would increase as they cover the world? I can't show you that in this particular figure, but I can tell you that these fossils, which are all over the world, right? Um, represent, uh, there's just about as much diversity at any time slice you want to take a look at here in the Pleistocene. It's not like there are hardly any in the first part and then it increases. But now here's the big challenge, right? Here's the point of serious confusion on my part. If we were to look at the genera that this represents, most of the genera and I mean most, I mean like I think 11 out of 12 genera are found here in the Pliocene and they're found in the Pleistocene. The same types of dogs, so like Canis, which is what the, the wolf. So there are wolves or wolf-like thing that are a wolf species, let's say, that's in the Pliocene, in the flood deposits, and then immediately in the Pleistocene we see in the same area, in the same places, we see more fossils of the same types of dogs. Foxes, there's multiple different groups of foxes. So like gray foxes, and then there's red foxes, and there's varieties of various things, right? Those foxes are found here, and they're found here. And this happens over and over and over and over again. So how exactly is the boundary identified and are these all different kinds how could this all be one kind if it's all one kind remember all of these let's go back all of these were shrunk down in a bottleneck just like i just read from ord all right when he's describing the effects of a global flood He's saying there's a giant bottleneck where two of the diversity of the prior living organisms are, redu are, are, are survivors. And they then give rise to, and they have less genetic diversity, he says, and they give rise to then more species afterwards, but not nearly the diversity. This data, straight from the fossil record, contradicts that because there is as much or more diversity here. Let's wipe our this off here. 
there is as much diversity in the Pleistocene in terms of species, in terms of genera, in terms of probably genetic diversity overall, measures of genetic diversity. There's as much diversity there as there was in the Pliocene. There doesn't seem to be a great break. There's not some massive extinction event that's obvious here. There are actually a fair number of extinctions that occur at that boundary, which is one of the reasons they picked that boundary, the Neogene Quaternary boundary. Um, and yes, there are some canines that go extinct right at that point. But there is a, a huge amount of diversity right after that point as well. So let's, let's show it to you in a different way. Um, here is a, a phylogeny showing the positions of different genera. So I know you probably can't read these, but um, we've got these are foxes up here. And then we have our um, canis sort of uh, group down here of wolves. And then we have uh, other sort of dogs that are neither wolves nor um, uh, foxes in here. Whole bunch of different species. Lots of these are extinct. All right, so if the line ends, like this one ends right here, there's an example of an extinction event right there that does occur right at the, Pleist the Pliocene and Pleistocene boundary. All right, so great. That one fits. But... Look how many of these lines where the fossils go across, all right? Look how many lineages where we have, you know, they cross the boundary. They're found in both sides, and these are species. If you think about it from a genus standpoint, like, you know, here's a genus right here. Clearly, there are members of the genus on one side and members of the genus on the other side of that boundary. Um, so how do they get from one side of the boundary to the other? Because they had to go through Noah's flood, and... They couldn't have all been on the ark, right? Unless all of these are different kinds, right? Did God create all these different kinds and then Noah preserved all those kinds? There are at least 30 crossover species and there are at least 12 genera, all right? Groups of species that cross over the flood boundary. So in my mind, there has to be at least 12 different pairs of canine-like things that are all separate canine kinds that were preserved by Noah so that they could continue to exist after the flood. Otherwise, you look at a figure like this and you have to say that it sure doesn't look like Noah's flood actually destroyed like all the canines. They managed to survive through that, uh, through that boundary. Um, now, the other interesting thing about this is if we go back and we ask, what about the other flood boundary that other creationists, other creationists suggest the flood boundary is way back here and like a lot farther back here because this is only 30 million years. If we go back to 65 million years, you notice that all the canines are joined to a common ancestor. In other words, all the canines are no more than 20 some million years old in the, in the fossil record. And so before that canines are unknown. They don't known to exist. Uh, so what what ICR has going for it is they do see that there are lots of canine species that are preserved in the fossil record. And so they can say that canines existed before the flood uh, and they were in the world and they got caught up in the flood and they got preserved. And they continue after the flood with this problem of how do they continue so many lineages. But um, they do have that going for them. And that's where, that's where um, Ward is saying there's diversity, there's more diversity before the flood than there is after the flood. And you can kind of make that argument since, since what they're not showing here is there actually are probably 50 or 60 different extinct species in here they're not showing. So there is a huge amount of species diversity that is no longer exists today. All right, so that kind of fits what he's been saying. Now, what Answers in Genesis has going for it is they say the flood boundary is back here. So it's not hard for them to say, oh, they look at the fossil record and they say, look, if we think that all canines are one kind, um, you can't have the flood boundary out here because, and this is exactly what they're going to say. They're going to say, you got 30 different species that are on both sides of the boundary. So no one must have had 30 different representatives of those 30 species, right? So two of each one. So they had 60 different canines on the ark representing 30 different kinds of canines uh, on the ark. Uh, 
And then all of a sudden the arc's gonna get really full, right? Because I could replicate this story for felines and for bears and for, you know, you name it, any mammalian group you want, we can show a similar looking uh, map and I can show you a similar set of fossils showing continuity right through the flood boundary, which then requires that Noah had those animals on the ark to represent those different kinds that pass through the flood. All right, so Answers in Genesis has an advantage here, at least for mammalian groups, because all the mammalian groups only show up after the flood. Of course, they then have a problem, right? Their problem is, is that they have no evidence that canines existed prior to the flood, right? Where do they all go? Were there any canines or are there any dogs before the flood? Because none of them got preserved in the fossil record. We've never found one. Uh, and that can be rep that problem can be rec replicated for them over and over and over and over and over with different mammalian groups like cats, like bears, like seals, right? None of them are found in the fossil record earlier than the, f the flood boundary. I, yeah, I don't know. I hope I communicated my frustration, right? I'm looking at the ICR literature and I'm looking at, I'm hearing young earth creationists talk and they, they always talk like, oh, all canines, because there's the possibility they could have, some of them can hybridize, although that hybridization uh, information about foxes and, and wolves hybridizing is kind of dubious, but they seem to accept it, right? And since they accept it, that for them requires them to believe that they are the same kind. Otherwise, how could they possibly have any kind of ability to uh, cross with one another if they're not the same created kind? But once they throw them into the same kind, I just don't, I don't understand how they can deal with this late Cenozoic flood boundary and have so many different species just going whoop, right across the boundary. And in some cases, it's that species was living in North America and in the flood deposits. And then here's the post flood deposits. And then there's the same species or an extremely similar species living in the same location deposited in post flood sediments. It's as if, okay, that dog uh, went extinct because of the flood and got preserved there. And then somehow a canine got off the ark uh, and then diversified into different species, one of which was so similar to its ancestor that lived in North America that we can't tell the, the difference between the two. And that dog made a beeline right for North America and lived right above its ancestors' you know, uh, fossils and then continue to be fossilized after that. It's, it boggles the mind how one would explain these coincidences because that's what they would be. You, you end up with thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of coincidences of locations of fossils if you form this boundary at the uh, Neogene uh, Quaternary line. Uh, and this is a serious problem for this particular model. And I just don't see anyone grappling with that problem. You know, it's as if, and they act like, you know, by continuing to just talk about dogs all being the same kind, all canines being the same kind, they're just not addressing the data at all. They're trying to ignore the fossil data. And this is exactly what Andrew Snelling and others at Answers in Genesis will say is that, uh, and they're absolutely right, right? That other young earth creationists are ignoring obvious data. Now, I started out by saying Timothy Clary has uh, a whole list uh, and Ord and others have lists of things that are problems for the KT boundary. And they're just as big of a problem, right? They're very serious problems for the KT boundary. And their model has enormous advantages over theirs from a geological perspective. Um, it's a conundrum, right? And then the conundrum is for young earth creationists because they, one of them has to be right. Right. Well, actually, they both could be wrong. The boundary could be somewhere else. But there has to be a boundary. If there was a Noahic flood and it deposited massive amounts of material and and organisms that died in that flood or deposited in that. And then there has to be a time on top of that in which organisms lived after the flood. All right. So there is a flood boundary out there. It has to exist if they're correct in their interpretation of world history. And, and they also recognize they need to find that boundary because they're going to argue forever about all these different things. 
about speciation rates, about biological diversity, about genetic entropy, about climate change, about uh, you name it. They can never, they will never come to agreement on almost any aspect of a flood model until they identify for sure where the flood boundary is. Um, help me out. So have, do you think that Institutes for Creation Research just doesn't think about this? Do you think that they just kind of like it's wishful thinking and they're just so used to talking about canines as all being one kind that they don't want to give it up? They don't want to just admit, well, really, God created like 15 different kinds of canines that are very similar to one another, but they're not the same kind, exact kind. They're different genera, like they've identified the level of what a kind is wrong. And so Noah had 15 different kinds on board still had the problem of how those kinds got back to the same locations on the earth that they existed prior to like how did the flood deposited how did how did those species know <laughs> right where the bones of their uh their parents were laid down in the flood so they could go to that same spot so they could die in that same spot and add more bones on top uh, that's always going to be a problem that's a problem for like all the creation models um, but this idea of crossover events through the FUD boundary uh, is I think one of the most significant problems for the neogene quaternary boundary but it's just as big a problem but for different groups of organisms for the KT boundary uh, and this is an, an issue that's not going away I'm not sure what my question is, but if maybe if somebody could get somebody at uh, ICR to actually think about this question, write about it, uh, respond to how they think they should deal with this going forward, or just even admit that it's a problem, that would be nice. All right, you know, that's my meandering thoughts uh, for this morning as I continue to try to wrap my head around the 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 differing uh, viewpoints on the flood boundaries and the ramifications of those and that's really what I've been thinking through is different ramifications of, of speciation rates and so forth um, as we see that Nathaniel Jensen and others are are going to be talking about that kind of thing uh, I can guarantee that Nathaniel Jensen is influenced by a particular view of where the flood boundary is and if he's wrong about the flood boundary then he is working off an assumption that will render essentially all of his results wrong. I mean, they may be wrong anyway, even with his assumption, but they can't be right if he's wrong about the flood boundary, his, his chosen point of the flood boundary, because it impacts all of his ideas about uh, um, speciation, diversification, and so forth after the flood. All right, I, I think that's enough for today. I just wanted to share that with you and I'm hoping to get a little bit of feedback and it just helps me uh, continue my thought process on this. Um, I'm just letting you see through my eyes uh, the kinds of things I ask myself as I'm reading this literature. Anyway, my name's Joel Duff and uh, I hope you got something out of this and if you did, hey, uh, subscribe to my YouTube channel and uh, we'll talk lots of more about the uh, flood boundary and species and genetics and uh, whatever else uh, you know uh, strikes my fancy at the moment. We'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.